So thanks everyone. Uh, thanks to the organizer for giving me this opportunity of presenting that talk that I'm pretty uh, excited to share here. So uh, I was mentioned, so initially my research was more traditional uh, in field of uh, uh, structural biology, structural bioinformatics. But when I arrived to McGill, uh, I had this, um, this line of research I started, how to merge two things I like to do. It's bioinformatics and video games. And um, the story I will tell you today is basically the, 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 the vision we have of what we're doing here and hopefully show you a couple of examples about application of these approaches to boost bioinformatics research. So what is the, the, the main purpose of this, this uh, the, the, the talk here is really about ultimately see how we can create and build alliances with the video game industry to bring bioinformatics research and actually research at large at the level of our society. Why uh, video game? I will explain because they are uh, ubiquitous. They're played by 3 billion people worldwide. And these people playing video game are solving problems. So they are very uh, powerful alliances we can build here. And we hope to show this project how we can do that and we can make it more systematic in the future of bioinformatics and science in general. But let's go back a bit and try to uh, explore the motivation uh, of this work, how, how we get there. It goes very far, uh, but let's speak first about the scientific method, which is what we're all doing every day. Uh, there's many ways of representing it, but the nice and simple diagram I like is like, well, it, ideally you're starting with a model, so it's a representation of the word as you imagine it, but it's not the word because it's just a model, but we need mathematical model to work with. So once you have this, you can emit hypotheses and test them through an experiment. And the result of the experiment uh, is analyzed. You extract knowledge and you can verify or, or uh, in, invalidate the hypothesis. And then that brings you back to the model when you have to adjust your model to make it more realistic. Because in the end, as I was saying, the model is just um, uh, your own abstract representation of something that you cannot access directly. And this is what we're doing every day that we're working in, in, uh, in bioinformatics and biology. The part of this pipeline that I will look at more carefully and that is more interesting for, for me in that talk is really this part when we're analyzing the result. And typically it's interesting for me because this is the part where you, of course you have computers and we already have because of computers to analyze the result, but ultimately, a computers without the, the researcher behind is nothing. So uh, this is crit critical part where you, uh, you take the, re the result of the experiment and you're having a look at it to, um, to interpret the result and eventually modify the model. Of course, nowadays, the, the, the truth is like we, we don't, we have using this uh, human computer interaction at scale where you take the result, you, you're cracking numbers, you you're cleaning the data and then you interpret it and then you adjust your model. So what we try to do uh, through this, the, the techniques I'm presenting today is try to uh, accelerate or scale up this um, systematic problem of analyzing the result in a scientific method. But now let us go back or go forward, depending on you see things, about what are the challenge of this scientific analysis? So typically when we are uh, we're taking any experimental data, any genomic data you're doing, you have multiple challenges you're facing. First thing is like, like any interesting problem we're trying to face, often it's an NP hard problem. Uh, that means that, well, it takes a lot of time to compute and eventually we cannot really uh, compute exactly. We just have to result on heuristics and algorithm to approximate an answer as good as possible. But that's one problem. And arguably I would say it's even not the most important. Because the, the, the most important fact is that we don't even have access to the ground truth. Often, when you, have a, you try to, to put a scoring function, to say, oh, good is my solution. What's the quality of my solution? You try to extract a number, but this number is just an aggregate of multiple metrics to try to, to compile here. And even if you try to optimize it, you're never 100% sure it's the, 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 the ground truth you want to access. So there's always debate. 
And there's always multiple scoring function like these that you're having. And in one of the problems that I will speak about that is, that is dear to me, like it's the, the multiple sequence line problem, for instance, you see there's many scoring functions that have been proposed. They're all good for, for my expect, but depending on the context you are, they are relevant or not. So what is a good one? So the to, to solve this issue and, and primarily the one of uh, knowing what is a good answer and make a distinction between the, the artifact versus the real one, we always rely on the human factor. And this is where the, the, the human uh, aspect, at this time of we speak a lot of AI intelligence, which is a catalyzer of everything, which is absolutely thing, but still the human is right at the center. Uh, just to, to be able to decide where it makes sense, where it doesn't make sense, which context it is. And um, so we always had this vision about having um, a single scientist in his lab alone, knowing the ground truth, working hard. And you have an example here with Mike Curie, I believe one of the brightest scientists of all time, uh, doing everything for us and knowing the more than the collectivity. But the truth is like, well, the science, the modern science is quite complex and you know it in bioinformatics, right? We have a lot of different experiments and techniques and measures that can be done. They all tell us part of the truth, but not all the truth. And for each type of data, you have a specialist. And no one can hug that he knows everything about all the data generated there. We all know part of, we have a bit of expertise and the goal is to, to acknowledge this. So how do we solve that in Classical bioinformatics. Well, we, we, we collaborate. And uh, if you look at this, uh, the, the, the fundamental uh, science project, these really huge consortiums, huge consortiums of uh, researchers collaborating all around the world, creating huge team, where we reach a point now where basically the, the author list has to go to the supplementary material because we don't have enough room on the front page to, to give all names. And uh, it makes sense, the natural um, uh, path of science forward. We are addressing more fundamental and, and difficult problems. And ultimately, we need to aggregate more and more expertise from many researchers. So the, the idea is that how can we aggregate this knowledge collectively and try to scale up? Because we have this huge team of hundreds of researchers, but I mean, imagine that each researcher is a lot of uh, training time is years, I mean, well, decades of trainings. Uh, we have a limited uh, uh, access to scientists that are competing for different topics. Um, and at some point, we won't be able to grow indefinitely the size of the research teams. And um, having professional scientists uh, dedicating full time and on the one specific problem. So we need to be able to see how all this full process of doing science collectively scale up to the level of society here. So what's the motivation? How do we want to do this? So coming back to the, uh, the problem we're trying to, uh, we try to address often in science, one thing that characterizes them is uh, the fact that there are what are called multiple objective, um, multi-objective problems. Typically when we, we're trying to, uh, to say, I said, make an alignment <laughs> was mentioning, about analyzing the data, you collecting different metrics, different measures from different aspects of, of your problems. And um, you don't know which one is the most important, but you know that you're capable of identifying a set of solution that is, that is good. And we can model that using what we call this multi-objective problem. That means that uh, we collect in different metrics for, for this problem. So how do we represent this? So say that here for this, the sake of this demonstration, I'm, I'm thinking about a multiple sequence alignment which is about aligning sequences, and for which there's basically two main parameters that we want to, to explore. That is the number of uh, matches, so basically when you try to put things in the same uh, column and column, and number of gaps, which is basically how much hole there is in your alignment. And they're not compatible in a sense that it's like comparing pair to apples. Both are important, but you don't know which, which way to give to that. So if you look at the, the, the optimal solution, say for your problem, in the case of multiple sequence alignment, uh, the optimal solution, the, the solution that they cannot be compared with that are all optimal, belongs to what we call here the Pareto front, which is this border, this frontier, that uh, is a set of all solutions that uh, cannot be dominated, that uh, optimizing parameters. 
The truth is like this function is that, as I was mentioning earlier in the talk, uh, is only an approximation. That means that it cannot give you the ground proof, but it's give you a good estimate about the quality of your solution. And that means that the true solution should live in a region close from this part of Rome. So this uh, in the Dutch region here. So this define basically the, the region in which the, 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 the real solution to your problem uh, belongs. So that's what computers do, basically being able to uh, compute in this part of front and identify this region when the, the, so the good solution might live. Once you, uh, you have this, this is where the expert comes in. Then you have the researcher, the scientist, that look at the solution generated by the computer programs and uh, try to identify in this subset of solution which one are the good ones. And how do you agree it's the good ones? By agreement. You never trust one single scientist, right? You, have, you, you put a couple of scientists together, they look at the data, and they say, OK, this looks right. If someone doesn't trust you, you try to convince your peer that it's, uh, it's the right solution. And then at some point, you are uh, agreeing that it's a good solution. And then you're building trust, which is something that you can create by computers. Just think about it. So this agreement between expert, which is the essence of doing science uh, collectively here, is building trust by uh, looking at this data here. So the paradigm we try to leverage uh, through the, the techniques I'm showing today is try, can we scale up this process and, uh, and make it more approachable by the fact that, well, we have a limited number of experts here, scientists. Can we make it, uh, uh, can we scale it? And this is exactly the purpose of citizen science, where the hypothesis we rely we on is like, assuming that you can present the problem in a way that is uh, sufficiently accurate to generate some answers, you can aggregate the solution of many uh, non-experts, what they call these citizen scientists, so the non-professional experts just mean that, doesn't mean we're worse, just mean we're not paid for this, um, to, to approximate the solution that an expert would give to you. And the, the idea here would be that Instead of asking experts to agree, you're asking many citizen scientists and experts to give their opinion. And by some sort of vote, a bit more complicated sometimes, but you, you hope that they will converge toward the solution that uh, would be found by the expert. And that ultimately would also generate trust in the result that you're generating. So that's the full concept behind the citizen science here. Try to scale up that by, by believing into the wisdom of the crowd and try to harness that power for science. So what we see here is really this intricate relationship between uh, a computer and human, where this whole process wouldn't be possible without computer, also of course, because uh, initially try to, um, to, uh, to navigate and explore the confirmation landscape of all solution is impossible by an individual, uh, even thousands of individuals. You really need computers to be able to, to direct you to the other region of interest where the potential good solution lives. But then after, you need the human brain, you know, the, the humans, to generate this trust into the result by aggregating and uh, asking them to collaborate. So now that we have a framework to make it work, we need the essential part, which is basically us. Uh, we need to bring everyone here uh, to collaborate to solve this problem. We need to put the science outside the, the academia. I mean, well, I mean, it's good to be in academia, but basically we have it in an ivory tower. We have to bring it back to society so that the full society can embrace science and, and live through it, which actually comes from, right? We were outside, we just, turns out we, we came back to uh, the concentrated universities, but we have to also go back to where we come from. How do we do this? This is where video games play their part. So imagine now, in a world, there's, we estimate there's more than 3 billion people playing video games. 3 billion people. That's a huge number. What is even more striking is like when you try to, descend, to realize what playing video games means. Well, you, of course, it means have fun. They're designed for this. But intrinsically, playing video game is solving a problem because our brain likes to solve problems. Every time you solve a problem, it makes us a bit happy. 
So we are addicted to video game because we are addicted to solve problems. What if we could just use a bit of the attention and the time, the energy, and the smartness of people here playing video games to solve some scientific problems? So this is basically the purpose of all the work I'm showing to you here. Now let's go back to bioinformatics and how this idea was implemented. So in 2010, uh, when I arrived at McGill, um, I, uh, I was sitting here with, uh, with Mathieu Blanchet, just here, uh, we have all offices were close to each other. And uh, I came to Mathieu saying, okay, I mean, we have some ideas here about uh, how we can turn some uh, fundamental problem in, uh, in uh, bioinformatics to a, to a game to try to engage people helping us solving it. Uh, it has to be uh, an important problem so, uh, on which problem can we work. And it turns out to be an immune specialist of multiple sequence alignment. I think it's a good fit, a good fit. And then we start to think about how we can do that. We're very lucky at this time that we had two undergrads that volunteer for the, for the, for the summer to play, to implement a prototype version of this game. It was really just like a summer project initially. And they implement an interface of uh, the game Philo that presented here. So what is Philo? It's really a game that aims to crowdsource uh, these through a games, this multiple sequence alignment problem. Its idea is relatively simple. Initially, I was uh, mentioning like we cannot. Our goal was to align a mammalian genome at the time, but of course, you know, a genome um, it's about three billion characters. Um, say we have 100 to align, it's not that easy to, I, I won't ask one people to do this. So uh, first we have to start with a good starting point, I was mentioning at the beginning. So what it is, well, we ask a software like to, to do it for us uh, and to pre-align these, these, these uh, genomes. And then the idea after that was like when it pre-align, we'll scan this, this alignment to detect region that potentially could improve. Because, well, on many places, the computer does a very, does a very good job. And there's no need to have human uh, intervention here. But there are some of them, where well, there's many gaps, many substitution, substitution things like this, where it's potentially imperfect and you might benefit of small corrections. We may be able to, uh, to the benefit of a bit of human supervision here. So you scan this alignment, you extract this region that potentially uh, could be improved and you store them in the database. This region that you extracted are the puzzles that would be played in the Philo interface, which is, uh, at the time it was a flash game. A few flash disappeared since then. So we had a couple of uh, other implementation. Currently it's, uh, it's in Unity, um, where um, you have some kind of Tetris-like game that represent, well, Tetris-like feelings at this time, we could say, that represent a bit the, the uh, this fragment of the, the DNA alignment and we ask the player to, uh, to improve this alignment according to uh, different approximated scoring functions. So uh, the player played this alignment, try to improve it, try to find better solution than the, the basic one found by the computers. We're collecting that and we reinsert them into the alignment. So actually, arguably, this, this fact of reinserting the solution inside is a tricky one uh, because you have many fragments, they're overlapping, you know, which we are. Yeah, they're just representing a, a, yeah, a fragment of the alignment. So there's many ways of doing it. Um, uh, we did it in, in a way that that works. Doesn't mean it's the perfect one or the optimal one, but in the end, we're able to show that uh, that helps to improve the alignment uh, pre-computed initially. But what now, what makes the, the fundamental, I mean, even success, actually the, the motivation of, of this project? First, uh, Philo was a game that is uh, that addressed a fundamental problem in uh, in molecular biology. And why is it important? It's because when Philo was released, uh, its purpose was to try to be played by everyone. So you go to a web page, you can play the game. And if you have this ambition of uh, being interesting for many people, well, you have to 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 uh, address a problem that will be that will resonate with everyone. That will be important for everyone. So uh, you need to have something that uh, is 
uh, important for the public, but also for the scientists, because when you collect results at the end, you want to do something useful with. Of course, uh, we had to identify that the problem was itself um, uh, difficult for computers. Uh, otherwise, what's the point of using human there? Because if we had a trivial solution with computers, I mean, you can just run the computers and and uh, and you don't need to involve human there because you don't empower them by doing this otherwise. And the key idea of Curve Philo here, that was I think I think very novel at the time we we launched it, is to make it a, a casual game. The idea uh, of Philo was to make uh, the game fun. So that sounds a bit awkward to say it here, but when you're playing a game, you want to have fun first. Your motivation is not necessarily to have science. Every science is good, I mean, that makes you great, but that's not your first motivation. The first reason you play a game is because it's fun. So we did many things to, toward that, uh, that goal that was to, well, we tried to have a lot of gamification element, putting colors here and there, simplifying the rules. Um, and also one thing here, like we, we had no res registration required. The idea was you go to a web page, you can play the game, or play one to game, and you leave it fine. Uh, you don't need to commit to, to register and be followed and see the progresses. And of course, this uh, has its own drawback because it's, uh, you have to deal with the noise generated for this approach, but at the same time, you have much more engagement. And it worked well. Uh, so about in about 10 years, we estimate that we have more than half million people that contributed. Uh, generated probably around roughly 2 million solutions for different puzzles. And we've been able to have the proof of concept showing that the, the reinsertion of the solution to the alignment was uh, indeed successful. So depending which objective function you try to measure as an algorithm, between 40 and 95% and, uh, and of the, the alignment we try to improve uh, could be improved. Sometimes it was marginal, but some, sometimes it was a bit more substantial. And this one is really applied to uh, mammalian gene. In particular, we're looking at the promoter region of uh, mammalian genes. So it was successful uh, as a proof of concept. Because the truth is that uh, to be very scalable, applicable for real size problem, it needs more engagement. And I'm potentially a game designer wannabe. Uh, but I'm not a game designer. And very soon, when I start interacting with uh, people in the game industry, I very soon realized that, well, Philo was fun, but I mean, like, it's fun for someone that knows the sequence alignment problem and things like this. And it's not really what everyone would like to, to play. The problem is, like, at this time, we wanted to bring this technology to a novel frontier. Uh, the proof concept works, but we want to address real problems that could make a real difference. And demonstrate it, and on state of the art and, and massive data, we can apply it to uh, this technology to, to improve the analysis. And um, one of the problems we identify as being one that would be a perfect match for this is really this microbiome field, where um, we collect um, tons of, of data from different microbes, and we basically to, to compare them. And this is actually the, the goal of a multiple sequence alignment here. So we get in touch with Rob Knight at the University of San Diego, which is leading this micro data initiatives, which turns out to be interesting for us as well because the micro data initiatives is really also a citizen science project. He's asking people to, uh, to send them stool samples uh, and they sequence it and build their own database. So there's a nice a loop here, I mean, well, nice independent with CFIX, but it's, uh, there's uh, an interesting parallel to, to make. And uh, in particular, in the, the database, they have what they're sequencing is a specific region of the 16S RNA called the V4 regions, hyper variable regions, that help them to quantify the diversity of microbes within the samples collected. And uh, to, to estimate this, uh, this diversity, they need to have, have different techniques. Uh, SEB, which is a tree based one, phylogeny based, but uh, ideally having an alignment of all these sequences would help to make a reference catalog in which they could, could potentially build a better alignment. So that's what we try to do. But for this, I was mentioning, we need to bring more people to the game. So how do we do this? This is where enter massively multiplayer online science. So it's a small Swiss company that was built in 2015, if I'm not wrong. 
uh, by Attila Snender here, which is actually also an uh, adjunct professor in our department at McGill, whose idea and vision was to say, well, let's bring uh, video game developers that knows how to, how to make game, no offense to me, Attila told me at this point, and two scientists that, that want to make game out of the science they're doing. So when Attila uh, built his company, uh, he approached different video game developers and scientists, and he built some different uh, projects. So the first one actually was EVE Online, was Project Discovery in EVE Online, which is, um, so if, if you know a bit um, EVE Online, it's a game developing by an Icelandic company called CCP Games. That is one of the, the most popular um, sci-fi uh, video games, online video games, played by uh, hundreds of thousands around the world. And it's about this game is about 20 years old. So it's, uh, it will have his, uh, actually, I think it has his 20th anniversary uh, this month. Uh, so it's a massive platform that, in that uh, developed this game. And inside, I managed to convince uh, the developers of uh, EVE Online to integrate some scientific tasks inside. And the first project was Project Discovery. And uh, we have one of, uh, we collaborate with Soviet on this, in particular to address this, this time the project of uh, flow cytometry. So I won't speak about it. Actually, we have a talk in a special session after by Alex Butayev explaining a bit more this, um, this project. But the idea was there. So uh, how to, to plug into a video game, a citizen science activity. So uh, this is an example of, of one of the tasks that you can find in EVE Online. But what you notice there actually is like the, I mean the, the, the interface is beautiful, it's quite neat, and it's a, but it's still quite sciencey. I mean, it requires a bit of training and it requires a bit of, uh, of uh, understanding about the science behind to, to, to play it. Um, and that works because EVE Online is really a game that is played by uh, usually people that are a bit uh, older, that like science, and that are receptive for playing this type for, for completing this type of activities. But our goal was to bring microbiome research to a, a large community, potentially even bigger than the one from, from Eve Online. And are typically like games like Borderlands. So Borderlands 3, if you're not uh, familiar with it, or I hope you are, but it's a game developed by, uh, by Gearbox. Um, so that's you in Frisco, in Quebec, and in Montreal. So it's um, that is basically a, a first-person shooter, looter, role-playing games. Like it's a, I mean, the goal you have big guns and you try to to shoot aliens. Uh, that's very fun. It's plenty for humor. It's a bit sci-fi. It's very fast-paced game. You having fun in this game. The problem, like, the, how can you convince people of all and science here to uh, to to do something for science? But we have to solve this equation because ultimately, this is what people are playing. Borderlands is one of the top selling franchise in the world. In 2018, that was the most best sell game by 2K. Uh, and take two, sorry. And, um, and this is a, the, the game that people are playing. This is the one that you want to, uh, to uh, integrate. So it was tough, uh, but we did it. Well, what I say, we did it actually, that's uh, thanks to, to Gearbox who did, and that's specifically about Gabriel Richard was here. And we also speak a bit later at the special session about how they would make this possible. But typically what we did, we tried to take Philo. We, we trashed it and we redid it. So basically, we tried to rethink the game and try to, instead of trying to adapt the scientific problem, we tried to rethink the game and insert the science into a real fun game that could integrate the universe of Borderlands 3. And that game, this uh, Borderlands science game that you see here, which is this revamped uh, version of, of uh, Philo, that is, uh, that you play completely differently. So typically now you, you're playing uh, really up down, the sequences goes uh, vertically. So you don't try to align, you try to, uh, to align vertically. Uh, the system of scoring was simplified but actually for the best, because at the same time, we'll be able to decouple different metrics to make it more relevant. And more importantly, when you, you're playing that game, it's much, uh, more, it's much faster. It's uh, much more enjoyable. Uh, 
the first time we play uh, playing Philo is something that was about one, two, five minutes for the easiest puzzles. You can spend uh, half an hour on other uh, puzzles. It's not something you play in major video games. So we had to address this. So there's many uh, work on the design that's been done there um, to make it more approachable. But there was also uh, a lot of work on integration. So how people will be able to, to approach it. And in particular, there was uh, how do you integrate immerse the universe without disturbing the player? Because one of the most important things in this game is the user experience. As soon as the user isn't happy, the game developer is not happy because leaving the game, the game has no, has no purpose. So you have to basically have a seamless in, in, introduction into it. And one of the ideas that was um, a genius idea, I would say here, was basically to, to build this arcade cabinet that you see here in the main game. Uh, on main station and to, to access the game through this other cabinet. So you don't, you don't break the immersion into the game. At the same time, you actually you enrich the narrative and the story of the game, and you provide an access to science. But the advantage of video games uh, and accessibility goes beyond just the, uh, the integration of the game. It's also because it comes with a lot of incentive, perks, and tools to uh, boost engagement. So when you're playing uh, Borderlands Science, you actually also collecting uh, skins and 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 boosts for your for your characters. So even if it turns out that it was not the main motivation, um, at, at the end uh, that still provide an additional level of engagement and and reason for for the players to to contribute to science here. So before speaking a bit more about the, 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 the science and the giving a, a quick overview about what's going on, I would just show you also the, the trail of Borland science. And uh, it's an important part of it because actually, when you enter the arcade for the first time, what you see, you see is this trailer here that explains the purpose of the project and, the, um, and, and its end goal. For many, imagine that you have about the tens of millions of people that play ball and science. It's maybe the first time in their life they hear about the, the microbiome, about bioinformatics. So beyond the research, research itself and the data analysis, what you have behind is like automatically you have many people you, uh, that, that start to understand a bit more about what is microbiome, why it's important. And you can empower them by contributing your research through the games. So the, the, the goal here, even if initially came from the, the, the data analysis perspective, is as important in terms of science communication and how to empower society being part of the research today. So uh, let's try to work the, the, the ball and science uh, trailer that hopefully will give an idea about what the project is about. Hey folks, this is Mayim Bialik, actor, PhD scientist, researcher, and your favorite person. Today, I'm here to talk to you about video games and science, and how we can grab both by their necks and make them kiss, consensually. Long story short, by playing Borderlands 3, you can contribute to real world scientific research, as in data that helps real people in meat space. Speaking of meat, did you know that more than half the cells in our bodies are alien? Only 43% of our cells are of human origin, belong to foreign microbes. These microbes have a massive impact on our body's health. The more we study microbes, the more we can learn about the accumulation of meat and existential terror that is the human body. These microbes are made up of DNA, just like us. Each microbe has its own special DNA signature, and similar species of microbes have similar DNA. If we could sequence all the different species of microbes found in the human body, which, remember, make up more than half of the cells in our body, we'd learn a ton about ourselves. To that end, the Microseta Initiative collected tens of thousands of samples of, to use the scientific term, doo-doo, extracted the DNA of the microbes inside, and sequenced it. Now we just need to organize this data. Unfortunately, though computers excel at certain tasks like crunching numbers or tracking down specific pornography, they're not so good at organizing DNA information. See, different species of microbes have similar but not quite identical DNA. That means mapping their sequences can be kind of ambiguous. The computer makes lots of small mistakes that can corrupt downstream analysis. Which brings us back to video games. 
So we've got several million sequences that are each 150 nucleotides long that are riddled with small errors from the computer analysis. How can we get rid of all these errors? With your help. We've taken the millions of DNA sequences and broken them down into bite-sized puzzles that you can play and solve inside Borderlands 3. And try not to think about the fact that the DNA came from human excrement when I use phrases like bite-sized. By playing Borderlands Science inside Borderlands 3, you'll be directly helping our scientists organize and compare this dung data. The game is simple. You'll be confronted with different strands of DNA, each made up of individual tiles. It's your job to place as many of these tiles as possible in their appropriate row while matching the colors. It's not always possible to line everything up perfectly, but that's okay. By playing the game and matching the sequences, you'll also be identifying the errors in our computer analysis and helping scientists across the planet build a better algorithm for the future. And since all this research is open access, the entire scientific community will benefit from it. This research could directly lead to a universal catalog of all known microbes, which could lead to new breakthroughs in food, medicine, exercise, the sky's the limit. And it all starts with you playing a video game. But if the pursuit of knowledge isn't enough of an encouragement to sort through virtual butt microbes, then fear not. Playing Borderlands Science earns you in-game currency you can spend on booster items for your characters. Oh, and this is all totally free. Just activate the Borderlands Science Machine on Sanctuary 3 and sort some gut microbes. So, yeah. yeah, one of the beauty of this uh, trailer actually is like, I didn't need to present the project myself, I just need to play the video and uh, they explain much better than I could do in uh, half an hour. So. Um, so I was mentioning, so this trailer actually perhaps was even more powerful and important than the game itself, because we're really explaining what we're doing here in bioinformatics. And now imagine that 4 billion people basically saw this, uh, this trailer, more than this, and, uh, and basically learned more about what we're all doing here. Uh, yeah, so to give you a bit of numbers, I mean, Borderlands was really started as a work project. Uh, I mean, it was this uh, uh, commando team inside the, the gearbox, believing in the in the in the project and willing to help us, and the uh, team of my lab trying to work with them to make something happen. Turns out that it was quite successful. At the end, we had more than four million participants. We collected more than 30, 130 million uh, solutions, um, and um, in terms of engagement, there's no project that has been uh, has been reached this number in a single project. So that was really uh, the first step forward. But actually, it's not just about engagement. To basically amplify this, this, re this research, we also need to, to create results out of it because you want to engage people, but also show them that the engagement was, was not in vain. So but long story short, well, I mean, we're still working on that, but we still have, we're still starting to have the first result here. Um, and um, the idea is like the aggregation collecting this data was not as straightforward uh, as you can imagine was as straightforward as it, as it is it should be we had to uh, to aggregate the data build new alignment and then after to evaluate the quality of the alignment but the truth is that uh, we don't have one single number that can tell us the alignment is good so we have multiple observation metrics that accumulate evidences to uh, to demonstrate the alignment we're creating was uh, at least as good as the state of the art and uh, I, I won't speak too much about this result here, but again, there will be things that uh, uh, Roman will be able to present also in a, in a, in a special session above, when the latest results of ball and science. But what we're able to show was that we have a better agreement with non phylogeny We had a better agreement with structural model and uh, uh, competition of effect size on, the, on different samples. So there was the aggregation making results out of it, but also the next frontier. And it's a work that is conducted here by uh, uh, Renata. That is, how can we take this puzzle here and try to extract new rules, extract new strategies, extract new techniques to, to, to build alignment? And um, these are part of the research program so we, we, we're pursuing, is taking all these uh, different puzzles, try to identify if humans are doing things differently than uh, different selected uh, bots and uh, algorithms. So the idea was to look at different puzzles, try a different basic tech strategies, uh, more advanced techniques, 
compare how they behave and see they behave differently. And then after try to, to develop some behavioral coding techniques to try to see if we can learn from the players better method to aligning it. So we had this first uh, work uh, that uh, Renata just presented at Kai uh, last month, uh, basically showing that, well, we can capture this. There's a signal we can capture. And uh, of course, we continue this to try to see if we can use it to build new automated algorithm for uh, correcting alignment or building automatically better alignment. But again, and that would be easy to, uh, to conclude a, a bit all the vision I'm pricing here, um, it's not just all about the data, it's also about us and the data. What's even more important here into, into the all the, the project I, I showed to you is that um, it really helped us to, to, uh, to bring science to communities that are usually neglected by the scientific communications. Scientific, uh, usually when you think about scientific communication, that's really uh, addressed to people with a natural uh, interest into science, are willing to, to learn this, or potentially, uh, potentially have artists inclined to, for the message. If you want to make science a big in society, you have to go where people live. You have to go where they are. In our society, we're all moving to this uh, digital world and video games will be part of it. And I was mentioning with 3 billion people worldwide and it's only growing. More importantly, if you look at the, the demographic bias, I mean, usually when you look at the, the people doing citizen science in general, there's, uh, it's, it's very biased uh, in, in, a, in a gender level of education. Uh, that's, uh, it doesn't address, speak to everyone. If you go to the video, to the, to the video game, basically you, you're speaking out to everyone. Uh, everyone so makes them play video games and you have able to, uh, to, to, to bring it to everyone regardless of its level of education and potentially make people realizing that science is fun, which potentially could, could be also the, the, the best uh, message we can send outside. Why are we all doing science? Because when we're doing it, we're happy. It makes us happy. We find new things. That's the same that you have in video games. And if you can let people think that now, by doing science, they can have the same emotion, then you can bring uh, people more believing in science and, uh, and thinking that it's indeed a way to go and it, it's empowering them uh, for doing this. So ultimately, yes, I, I believe they can uh, reinforce public trust, I mean, contribute to reinforcing public trust and potentially inspire. My, my, my real dream would be that one day people that play this game uh, will become a scientist and will say it's because I played Borderlands Science when I was a kid. So just to conclude here, um, we need, with the message I want to bring here is like, it's true, there's a lot of fantastic things happening with AI and machine learning intelligence doing here, but science is intrinsically human. When we're doing it, it's, we are at the core of science. Uh, AI machine learning is a real catalyzer for what we're doing and we're using it a lot to, to leverage this data. But ultimately, we never have to forget that human is at the center of science and bioinformatics here is a good example because we can do, uh, we can really benefit of, of uh, both aspects. So I want to thank everyone in this project. I'm pretty sure I forgot uh, some people. If you want to hear more about this project, we have a special session upstairs. Uh, Gabriel Richard was the, the, the genius, the game, the brain behind uh, Ball and Science will explain how we did it. Uh, and uh, Roman was the, the, the workforce before all the, the, the science scientists who presented the latest result and hopefully you'll be convinced that it works. Thanks everyone. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, you're right. It's really about ensemble method in general. Try to see a pattern. 
Um, there's a lot of bias, right? Like you, with something we identify even with Philo initially. For instance, just one example could be that uh, we use colors, right, to um, to uh, to color the different nucleotides, the ties of different colors. Imagine some are red, some are blue. I mean, we might be some some people may might be more inclined to align the, the red first for whatever reason. So there's a lot of different uh, this sort of shifting of the columns. You have to, to randomize things. There's a lot of randomization of multiple different uh, elements that has to be done to try to eliminate as much as possible all these bias because they exist. We know it. I mean, we know the human brain is a very powerful machine, but we know yes, that we have a lot of cognitive bias as well. Uh, so we try when designing to, uh, to address them as much as possible, but it really comes at the level of the design. This is why it was so important to work closely with game designer to, to be able to identify when something can become uh, an issue and, and when it may not. Um, and that's, uh, that's part of the, of, of the challenge of building this game. Now, about uh, building a tutorial and things like this, um, yes, it's true. I mean, that they might converge. I mean, the truth is like in practice, uh, we saw some, um, some um, many tutorials online. Some people even thought that they found a trick to, to, uh, to solve the ball and send puzzle. Turns out that it was actually some, uh, some tests and the features that we int intentionally inserted inside, and it was make sense that strategy works. Uh, they're popular, but not that popular to the point you have to worry about it so far. Uh, and sometimes that's something we haven't explored. Uh, potentially be uh, interested to explore is like, well, you generate curiosity. And I wouldn't be surprised at some point they come up with something that you didn't think about before that, that is relevant. So maybe uh, mining this, these resources could be useful for, for us as well. Um, there's nothing bad from my perspective of, of uh, generating curiosity, and I don't want, do not worry too much about the impact it may have on the result. There's many things can do after afterward to, to filter the result. Uh, we don't use raw, raw data, we're filtering them, of course. Yeah. Well, I feel that that's the, the, the will trend. Thanks for the question, because that's actually exactly the, the type of expertise we try to bring there. I mean, uh, the purpose, um, I mean, not all game can make into video games. No, oh, sorry, not all, all science fiction can make into video games. Or uh, at least there is some different matches that can be done. Um, uh, there are some some games that naturally as a natural fit to some video games. And the, the work of MMOS and Attila was basically together we're uh, exploring different type of problems to identify the one that could be a good match for specific video games. So the idea every time is to find a good match between a problem that has a potential to be uh, gamified to create a nice game and the host game that would be a good uh, host for this activity. So there's a lot of um, try, we're making it, we're exploring a lot of differentiation and try to identify the best one. Sometimes we may have a good idea of match, but maybe there's not enough data on the scientific side to generate enough games. When you, you um, we have 130 million solution in, uh, collected into a ball and science, uh, we need to be sure at the beginning that we have enough data to, to, to generate the puzzle because you don't want to basically uh, uh, run out of puzzle after half a day. Just for the story, when we launched ball and science in, um, in, uh, in the first half a day, we collected five times more data than Philo in 10 years. So we, we had to anticipate already that we have uh, a lot of data for this. So it's all these parameters we have to address. Uh, and the second part of your question was to evaluate. evaluate. Yeah, it's what I'm saying here. There's, there's two aspects. I mean, there's, for the uh, alignment here, there's no, I cannot tell you, I have a single number that tell you, okay, my alignment is the best. We can just accumulate evidences that compare to other uh, the metrics, uh, we have a higher likelihood to have 
a, a good result. And typically, this is why we, we look at the, the phylogeny, how the phylogeny was uh, coherent, the one we already known on, on larger samples from the 60s. Uh, we look at the effect size. Basically, we have association between some uh, meta variables. So if you have the diabetes, if you're drinking alcohol, something like this, and see if it uh, has an impact. And we also, because we are lucky to be enough in a, in a, we have a structural model, we try to map the alignment on the, on the 60 net structure. So we saw the conservation was more uh, was closer to the non-model than the, than the one. So it's really a collection fix. At the end, do we re-answer a question? No, because our goal was to build this catalog and bring it to this community after, to make sure that it's there. There's tons of research to do after that with this, and our goal is really to bring it after the society so they can, people can use it also as well. We continue on our own, but we have limited um, uh, forces. So uh, hopefully people will dig this data also. Our goal is actually to release all the data so people will be able to have a look at it if they want to. Yeah, so indeed, thanks for the question because that's uh, one important aspect of things too. Uh, I mean, I started really from the uh, data analysis perspective when the goal was to say, okay, I want to uh, make uh, algorithm better. But at the end, I realized the impact of people is even greater. So that becomes even one of the major motivation. Um, we haven't worked yet with sociology. That's definitely one direction we want to go uh, by building connections. But first, we had to demonstrate that, that it works and that the goal is to to pull out all the results we have there to, to, to show people that he has potential and so you'll be adopted and then start revisit this data. Indeed, I think there's many things that can be done in terms of uh, uh, understanding, having a, a survey, understanding what's the impact of the trailer, because I think the trailer itself should be studied. Right? So how would it impact people, the, the understanding of public, the, the understanding about what microbiome and willingness to, uh, to, uh, to, to listen the science discourse. Um, just this will need to be, um, to be studied. Um, to be fair, we haven't started to do it because uh, we had too much work just with the data, the scientific data itself, but that's something that, that, that needs to be pursued and that we, we hope to do or leave people doing it for us. Uh, in general, we putting things open. And there was something else I want to say, we was mentioning after. It was the second part of your question. Uh, yeah. There's well, something else I wanted to say, but I would say it some. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, but that's that actually below the question uh, was in, uh, indeed. Uh, you always have this risk, right? Every time that you, uh, and whatever you're doing, there's always a bias, right? Um, so it's a dream of making things unbiased, but it's a, um, the only answer I can provide for that is like, we're just aware about it and try to address it as much as, as possible upfront by understanding, uh, uh, improving accessibility to everyone, uh, making sure that the game design element won't buy a solution from one direction or another. Um, you always have, at the very least, if one bias you cannot avoid, are the population playing the video games. Uh, but that's by design, that's something you, uh, you have to deal with. Um, so I don't have a solution for that, except saying that it's something that during the design, the game designer knows about it, right? So uh, we just uh, openly discuss it, and we try to do our best during the design process to address it. 
consider benchmarking these solutions with a group of neurology psychology students stuck in the room for 30 minutes, how many puzzles would they be able to do without the gamification of this? And whether the, you know, think about, again, this is fascinating, but think about all the time that people spent on this versus time they could have been, you know, solving these alignments with more forethought or as part of, you know, like, would that be more efficient or less efficient? It, this is kind of explores, you know, exploits the free time that people are wasting. Can I say wasted on video games? Well, there's many things. First, the, the challenge is scalability. Um, you won't be able to convince uh, 4 million people to play video to sit in a room uh, playing, uh, installing Java view and uh, trying to improve the alignment. So uh, I think it already addressed something. In terms of wasting time, actually often there are the main spaceship people are just chill out, uh, discussing with friends or waiting people that went to a mission and coming back. So it's virtually time that would spend there. So maybe it would spend on something useful there too. Um, it would be interesting to to, uh, to quantify this in terms of uh, benefit you can get from uh, from uh, someone, uh, an expert, someone with a tutorial doing it alone to try to quantify it. To, that would help us to quantify the benefit we have from the game, actually. Yeah. Because I strongly believe that uh, this game is so well done, the tutorial is so... I was amazed myself when I saw the tutorial that they did, they did to, to try to learn the rules. But I, I didn't have the feeling I was learning to do something related to science. I just had fun to try to to learn the rules there. And I was acquiring a skill without knowing it. Uh, so that will help us to better quantify the, the benefit we, we, we're bringing there. And maybe now I remember the question I want to address here, because one very important aspect there, initially we had Philo, that basically became obsolete because it was, a, it was a previous version. It was just developing on, on the website of my group. Um, but I was really looking at the statistics, and sometimes I have 30 people playing here, 40 people playing here. It was classrooms, right? They're using the game as a support. And so Philo really become this, became, we try to push it still now by having like a storyline version of it, try to, to, uh, to make it a support teaching tools, still using science behind. So um, there's the sociology, the, the, how the, the mind works, that is interesting to get the data, but also we can use this thing to, to better bring and support educations of this fundamental concept.